Imagine a world with no cold calling. A world where companies don't sell your data to other companies who want to pester you. At G4 Claims, we don't cold call and we don't buy a single lead from data companies. Oh, and if you're due any compensation from your car accident, you pay nothing to us at all. For full accident management support, including motor replacement, repairs and personal injury compensation claims, just search G4 Claims today for help the way you want it. Uh, hi and welcome to this week's episode of the DW Podcast. I am joined all the way from Texas by Jarrett Reddick, frontman of the band Bowling for Soup, amongst many other things. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. It's uh, it's good to be here. It's nice to uh, nice to hear the Scottish accents. It's been uh, it's been nine months, I guess, since uh, since I've we've been over there. So I uh, I miss it. It's been a while. Before uh, before I came on, I was checking out. I mean, for those that, that know me and knew me as a teenager, they, they would know that Bowling for Soup were my favourite band growing up for many years. And I had a look earlier to see the first time that I, I went to a Bowling for Soup gig. And believe it or not, I don't know if you remember this one because you've been over so many times, but it was 2002 in the Glasgow Garage on Socky Hall Street. And it must have been just after your album Hangover, You Don't uh, Drunk Enough to Dance came out. Yeah. And uh, it was my 13th birthday or my 14th birthday. And I remember my dad taking me in in the car and he waited outside because I think it was over 14s. And he's like, I'm just going to wait here and make sure that you get in. And I remember getting past the bouncers and the doorman and I was absolutely buzzing. And, and since then, I mean, been to so many shows and it almost seems like you were the, the soundtrack to my teenage years. I love it. I do remember that show, actually. Um, yeah, I uh, so th- that was sort of the rise of... Um, of our popularity, as you said, drunk enough to dance, it just came out. So, um, we were, you know, we, we were starting to do really, really well over there. And, uh, I remember I, it was cold and, uh, I, it have been October. So that's a bit right. Yeah, I used to wear a, I used to wear a hat and so it would hide my hair. So, no, so that nobody would recognize me. But what I didn't take into account was that, um, I don't ever wear long trousers. And so I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking through the crowd or whatever to go watch the other bands. And uh, I've got my, my uh, nor- normal cut off Dickies on and my legs are all tattooed or whatever. So it's just a dead giveaway. Um, so that was a nice surprise to just see that, uh, that people could recognize me um, without just my hair sticking up. And, it's uh, funny because that, that, I was do remember small, that, show. that was a small venue in comparison. It must hold about six, 700 and, and since then, you know, I've seen you in venues up to three, four thousand, even more, you know, festivals and, yeah. and the likes. So that really was the start of your journey. Yeah. And, you know, but I mean, that's sort of the size of venues that we were playing at home. Um, it really probably did, wasn't a small venue for us at the time. Um, you know, now uh, in certain in certain countries, I guess it would be. But, um, you know, it's... Uh, it, you know, it's, it's funny how, you know, you got five or 600 people there versus like a thousand, 1200, you know, three, 4,000. I mean, it, 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 it sort of just becomes the same. I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know really how to put it. I mean, you're, you're doing the same show, you know, yeah. and it's just sort of like an expanded, you know, group of people. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I definitely like those, smaller venue shows there's an intimacy there and just being able to hear the crowd and and things like that and um obviously i i don't mind hecklers um to me that's just fuel for the for for my comedy so um you get a little bit more of that in the smaller venues but uh but yeah that was a great time i mean um for us it it was you know the bit song had done so well over there and then girl the bad guys want came out and it just blew up uh and was doing super well we were actually um we had only done two tours over there with other bands before we did our first headline tour so um you know we were very very fortunate that we caught on so quickly see when you're when you're growing up in somewhere like texas so for me i'm from just outside glasgow quite a small town in scotland and i think i see texas as such a another world you know uh, i almost think of south america well south of america uh, as being like cowboys and rednecks and yeah you guys are totally not like that and to come over here and 
it's like, what do you think of when you think of Scotland? It must be kilts and whiskey, and the reality well, is <laughs> we're actually so similar, you know? Not really. I mean, you know, I think, first of all, it's, you know, it's important to point out that, you know, I think Texas does breed that. And I think we sort of all wear it on our sleeve to an extent to, like, to to say, you know, yeah, we got we have horses everywhere and, you know, there's all this stuff. But it really isn't like that. I mean, I don't know, you know, I don't have one friend that wears a cowboy hat, you know, on a regular <laughs> I mean, you know, I know a bunch of country musicians, so I guess I can't say that. I mean, I, I, you know, but for the most part, when people from over there, you know, from the United Kingdom come over here and, and most friends that I have that have visited, they're just like, I could live here. This is the greatest place ever. Totally. And people here are really, really nice and actually overly nice. You know, that's like people from the north come down here and they're like, I went and got a coffee and this lady wouldn't stop talking to me. <laughs> you know, and it's yeah. like people are just nice. But no, I mean, really, the only thing that was shocking for us from Scotland's standpoint was, um, you know, the act, your, the accent. I mean, and it, and it really wasn't until after the show, um, after one of our first shows over there, we went to university, and uh, we went upstairs to the to the pub that was located there, and that was when we realized, like you know, with loud music going on and like someone talking in your face and you can't really read their lips because <laughs> I mean, and you have, we, we were, all of us are just like, I have no idea what these people are saying, you know? Um, so, you know, obviously we've been coming over for 20 plus years now. So uh, we've got, we've pretty much got it down. I can, the thicker of the accents, I can, I still do pretty well. We'll, uh, you know, have to put, put, uh, I will have to stop you, you know, every once in a while and, and ask you to repeat something if, if we're in like a really heated conversation. <laughs> I think you've almost got a, a good impression as well. You, you're, uh, I've heard you try and impersonate a Scottish person once or twice and, and you're certainly good. <laughs> well, my, my Scottish impression is just Mike Myers from, uh, you know, from uh, So I Married an Axe Murderer, you know, just doing the, you know, he's just pissed. Uh, <laughs> what, what does he say? He goes, why don't you go cry yourself to sleep on your huge pillow? That's you know, and, uh, <laughs> like, um, and there's, uh, why don't you tell him about the time you shoot your pants? <laughs> and, uh, you know, those, that's pretty much the best Scottish thing I can do. And man, I used to be able to do a really good British accent. This is crazy. But what happened to me was I, it started to become Australian and now I get, they all get mixed up in my head. I really have to focus to be able because most Americans who do an accent from your part of the world, and I'm not, I don't mean Scotland. I mean, you know, obviously the posh, like English accent or whatever. Yeah. Everybody does Dick Van Dyke, you know, hello, Mary Poppins. <laughs> and um, yeah. And so you try not to do that when you're impersonating people because you don't want the, them to think that you're taking the piss. But, uh, but yeah, I, um, it's, that's just one of those things. It's, it's so uh, similar though. You, you, you mentioned there like, you, you wear the Texan thing on, on your sleeve. And I think Scottish people are very similar. Like when we yeah. go, go to other countries, we embrace it. You know, people want to talk to us about haggis and kilts and whiskey. And as much yeah. as that's not your daily life, you know, you're happy to talk about it. And you're happy yeah. to be proud of your, your heritage, aren't you? Yeah, it's, you know, it is. It's it's one of those things where, yeah, I mean, yes, we do. People do carry guns here. And, you know, I will I will happily talk to you and say that, again, most of my people I know do not. But it it is a thing. A lot of people ride horses it's that's a thing that we boobs and um around here and you know all of the ladies of dallas texas have huge tits <laughs> and uh it's just um you know there's 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 definitely things about this state that uh you know i mean it was weird a few years ago because there was that interest in texas and then um i remember george bush got elected president and you guys did not think fondly of him over there in your part of the world and so everything was just about george bush that we got asked about all the time and we're just like i don't know anything about that guy you know what i mean like i it's I, you know whatever i it's it, but we lived through that and now uh and now and now look at us you know <laughs> now look at the political state. everything's fixed <laughs> oh, it's mad and, and i think that British people and, and Scottish people have this stereotypical opinion of Americans and it's so far from the truth and you're such a wide, diverse country, you know? Mm. Yeah. 
definitely. I, I, I definitely think that, um, I think, especially just talking to my, like I have several friends who I talk to daily on, on, on uh, text or whatever. And some of them are more Americanized than others, you know? And so I definitely have one friend in particular that will see something on the news and he'll just be like, Oh my God, what do you think about this? And I'm like, I didn't even know that that was going on. Like I have no, I mean, it affects my daily life. None, yeah. you know? Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think we sort of uh, have a laziness as far as like, you know, to us that, that people, that, that people think that we're lazy and we're not, you know, we just, we do like convenience, you know, and that's the thing is like, um, you know, we put air conditioning in everything, you know, every car, every house, it doesn't matter. You can live in a place where it snows 360 days a year and that place is still air conditioned. Um, <laughs> and we're, uh, we're the opposite. We need, we need central heating absolutely everywhere and we freeze to death. Yeah, no, believe me, I know, I know. But I, but that's the thing about over there. This what we like over here is air movement. It's just like something to move the air. And what's super common in your in in your part of the world is just no air, just stale air. So you'll just and the air is just sort of sitting there, and it. We find that to be very stuffy and hot, and you know it's. Uh, but you know you get like it's like anything else. You just get used to it. I'm, I'm looking at the background of where you're sitting just now, Janet, and I'm. I'm looking at those discs, and I'd imagine that's all the albums that you've got there behind you. Yeah, so uh, behind me, I have all of the uh, Bowling for Soup albums framed um, all the way up until our latest one, which was uh, Live and Very Attractive, um, a live thing that we did at Brixton. Um, they're all up there. And uh, then uh, over here on my other shoulder is a painting my wife did of my favorite comedian ever, George Carlin. And uh, he is, uh, you know, obviously not with us anymore, but uh, I, it's my, you know, my little dose of, 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 uh, of happiness back there. And I suppose like for people that, that know you through Bowling for Soup, they'll always think that you're a musician, but you mentioned comedy there. And I, I feel that your live shows are very much a comedy sketch as well as a, a live <laughs> performance of music. Yeah, we do try to, I mean, you know, that, that became part of the show pretty early on. And really out of necessity more than anything. I mean, when we first started playing shows in a lot of places, um, when you're playing bars in America, you know, especially back in the day, they expected you to fill the whole night. So you, they wanted you to do three sets. And, you know, we just, we didn't have that many songs. And so we just started doing stupid things like magic tricks and telling jokes and, and just, you know, getting into conversations about nothing. And, it caught on, you know, I mean, that, that's just, that's part of our show. Um, it's just, I mean, you know, it's, it's a reflection really of just who I am. I mean, if you listen to even any, any, any of my podcasts, uh, whereas right, rockstar dad or Jared goes to the movies or uh, BFS fan page rampage. Um, if you listen to any of those, you'll see that I, I tend to go off topic quite a bit and then I'll, I'll kind of come back around and get to what I want to say. Um, and so, yeah, I, that, that definitely brings itself into the, into the live show. I mean, we're there to make you happy and make you smile. And a big part of that is, uh, is making you laugh. Absolutely. Do you think that's in your blood? Where, where does that come from? Cause you're obviously a natural performer, natural talent, you know, man, I guess it is, you know, I mean, my, um, my biological father was in a band his whole life. He could play all the instruments and all of that, you know, and my, um, I don't know, man. I just always liked making people laugh. I was a fat kid. Um, and so, you know, when you're, when you're a heavy kid, you know, you find ways to, to get people to like you, to pay attention to you or whatever. And I, I was really able to be the class clown, um, be funny in school, but I didn't really get in trouble for it a lot. Most of the time I could kind of be funny and my teachers thought it was funny too. And then when they had had enough of me, they would say, okay, you know, that's, that's enough. Let's, you know, and, and I was pretty, um, I was pretty good about that, but yeah, I mean, I, it's just one of those things, you know, I found, I, I just always loved making people laugh. And then I got into theater whenever I got into high school and that was just like this. If you listen to the song, my hometown, where I say this song goes out to the professor uh, who said, Sud, pick a path and stay the same because charisma is the key to opportunity. I actually made that line up, but in, 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 
he really did say those things to me, but just not in so many words. And um, that was sort of my coming out of just being like, man, I just like being on stage, like I, just a microphone. You know, my uh, my tour manager says now it's just like, man, I because he has to take me everywhere. So like, if we're on the road and I decide I want to go to karaoke after the show or whatever, <laughs> you know, or to a bar, he's just, you know, he's okay. Let's go. So he has to take me. And uh, anytime we walk in and there's a microphone and people are on it, he'll just go, oh, shit, you know, because I, I'm going to end real. up, I'm, <laughs> I'm going up there whether they like it or not. <laughs> that's amazing. And I, I think that's a testament to you guys as well. It's not like, and this maybe, it's maybe changed as, as you've got older and the band's matured, but it seems like everywhere that you go, you go out in the town afterwards, you know, you make the most of it. It's not like you're there and you're back on the bus and into the next place. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely always, uh, especially afterwards. I mean, um, you know, we, 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 we did some touristy stuff early on in the band. Like we would go out and see things like we, you know, Stonehenge or a church or, a you know, whatever. Um, we sort of got over all of that pretty quick. Um, and, and, and that like, you know, I don't know, we've kind of seen a lot and every time we go, it's just, you know, it's a whole thing and there's something, you know, it's like, something with a ride and all that. So we don't necessarily go do touristy stuff. A lot of bands do. Um, we just don't, but we definitely will go out on the town. I mean, we will go out and go to lunch, um, at some local place pretty much every day. Um, and then we always find a pub at the end of the night, if there is one close and, uh, you know, try to usually our fan page is pretty, aware of where it is we're going to go or they'll go somewhere and invite us. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll know where they are and can go in and say hi to the people who support us the most and all that, you know, um, I think, I think that's important. And, and just to be able to, to set, you know, to have something come away with a show in a city, something other than like, Hey, you guys were awesome. Thank you for applauding for our songs. It's nice to go, Hey, we had a fun time over at, you know, Bill's bar and, um, and, and, you know, and and, and that, that's just something that we enjoy, you know, and, and, and to be fair, it's, you know, you're, you're on that bus so much, you know, you, you just, it's kind of nice to get out of there, even if, if you go to a, you know, pretty crowded place. Yeah, obviously, I don't want to go any crowded places right now, but, uh, yeah. you know, it's uh, hopefully soon. <laughs> it's interesting that you, you touched on the touristy stuff, because I totally agree with you, Jared. I feel that you know, you, you can go to these places and it's almost like a tick box exercise, isn't it? It's like people say, oh, you go to this country, you have to visit here. You go to this city, you have to visit there. But you actually, in my opinion, you see what a city and a country is actually like by meeting the people and going to the bars, yeah. you know? And, and that's actually probably more valuable than going and seeing something that you could get a photo off on the internet. Yeah, we had a, um, we had a guest on Rockstar Dad recently, a, um, a musician who just basically took his family sold everything and they just went to different countries for two weeks at a time. And they lived in Airbnbs and they didn't go do touristy stuff or eat out. They, they went to local grocery stores and they went and it's just, that's the bedding yourself you can go there and do that. I mean, it's hard to do that when you're only in 18 hours, but you definitely, you know, it's fun to go out and, and, you know, people, I mean, obviously we're pretty lucky in that when we were, we're very recognizable, at least Chris and I are, are very recognizable. And so when we go anywhere, um, and especially after a show in a city where there's a bunch of people that were just there to see us, um, you know, people are really nice and, you know, it's, it's nice to have people buy you a beer and you can sit and chat with them about that, and, you know, um, and the bar is usually happy that we're there and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, you, you, uh, that's, that's definitely a nice part of the whole, you know, existence and touring and stuff like that. Do you think, I mean, you guys have been going for how many years now? Maybe 25, 26, seven years? 26. Yeah. Well, it's about, about 26 and a half now. Do you think that, you know, that social aspect and, and sticking together and, and going out and having fun has kept you together? Because you must have seen so many bands over the years that have came and gone, you know, released albums the same time as you done let's do it for johnny or drunk enough to dance and have just disappeared and yeah i, mean, I know you guys yeah um yeah yeah it's you know it's something that i talk about quite a bit i mean you know it's it's sad really i mean because even some of the bands that are still going that release music around then 
you know, they, they don't necessarily like each other, you know, like they, you know, you have, I've, I've, you talk to bands and they're like, yeah, our kids have never met, you know, and, and then, and, you know, they separate dressing rooms and these two don't like these two and that kind of thing. It, it was really early on for us when we decided, Hey, you know, when, when this isn't fun anymore, let's not do it. And really the only time that that ever became a possibility was back in 2013 when um, both Eric and I were going through a bunch of personal shit. Both of us got divorced and I was in a really bad custody battle. And, you know, the band was kind of, well, not kind. I mean, the band was uh, not really a positive strike in the, you know, trying to get custody of my kids and, and that because the travel is, you know, not great. Uh, and so we did a farewell tour over there to basically just say, hey, we're putting on the brakes. We need to we need to take a little time off. And it was the best thing we ever did. I mean, we we took that time. So we we took took time off from 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 traveling internationally. We would do a few shows here and there just to just to make sure that we could still get a paycheck. Um, but, you know, we legitimately took six, eight, nine, ten months off. I can't remember what it was, but it was it was a a bit. And it was the best thing ever because when we came back, it was like, okay, we must have just needed that because everything was just fresh and awesome. And we were just shot out of a cannon, yeah. um, for lack of a better term. And, um, you know, it's been like that ever since. I mean, even with, you know, Eric leaving the band, you know, he's gone on to do what he wants to do. And Rob has been such an amazing addition and energy to our band. It's like we're, we're just kind of refueled all the time. To back up and answer your question, you know, the truth is, is that we really are best friends. I mean, we're, we're you know, um, me and Chris s sat and texted the entire night while, during the uh, boxing matches the other night when Mike Tyson fought. You know, we we text all day, every day. We have and our crew are the same. Like we have a whole text thread with crew members who are current and past oh, yeah. and that. And, and we talk all day, every day, you know, somebody is talking because, you know, we're a family yeah. and we treat our crew the same as we do ourselves. You know, if we get something to eat, they get that. And if you want to invite us to a bar and you only have four places available, then we're not going to go. You know, we need nine. Um, and that's the way it should so, be. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that's a big part of it is just the family atmosphere that we've managed to create and keep and, you know, Guys that go off and work for other bands always come back because they're just like, there's just no organization like this. And, uh, you know, I love, I love that. I mean, you know, Chris and I have been in this band 26 years. Gary's been in 21, uh, 22, I guess. Rob, you know, two or three. Um, and I, I, it's the happiest I've ever been right now. So, you know, I, I don't really see any, anything. Uh, we just went and made a record and it like just being together for two weeks was fucking awesome like we had I watched the, the videos that you put on instagram where you was going down on the bus and then you had the <laughs> the, the apartment yeah. that you rented and it looked like you were just having a great time I had a great time and like we we were socially socially distanced from it we spent a fortune on that fucking bus to get there <laughs> but you know what i mean we did it we weren't around other people we didn't have to get on airplanes like we went we went into a couple of stores and we wore masks then we get to our part. We have our own house, and we, we go to the studio, and there's nobody else allowed in there, and it was just great. We took the bus back, and and uh, you know, next year there'll be a new record, and we're super proud of it. So, but you know, honestly, that that record exists because we wanted to hang out. I'm not kidding. Like we that that it was literally like uh, COVID hit March. We start canceling this show, this show, this show, this show. All the shows are canceled, and we're hanging out on Facebook. And I'm just like, fuck this, man. We got to do something. Let's just go make a record. We're coming. Uh, Rob had just been in a studio up near his house. And uh, and so I was just like, all right, fuck it. We're going. Gary, how many days can you be gone? And that's how many days we'll be gone. <laughs> yeah. And we went and did it. Does that change as you get older? You mentioned kids there and obviously you've got a family. And I suppose that touring and, and recording must take its toll. And I suppose you must have to think about that a bit more than you did when you were younger. Yeah, you know, it's funny because there's so many bands that we talk to now that are getting into it. I mean, and, and, and it's probably our age. You know, it's it's probably that, you know, bands that we've grown up with um, and who have been doing this as long as we have, everybody's having kids and, and everybody's got families and, and, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, you know, um, it was rough for me because I had kids really early. Um, 
2003. So right when the shit was really crazy. And so uh, it was hard for me not to miss things, but I, I did the best I could. Um, you know, now that I have it, I have an eight year old now and, but, and then Gary has a little, little kid. Um, we just try not to be gone for more than, you know, 10 days at a time. And then once you're home, you try to make sure that you're home for a month or so. And so, you know, I mean, and you could see that uh, how our touring has changed. I mean, you know, we used to do legitimately three and a half, four week tours of the United Kingdom. I mean, we, we would be over there for a month and uh, now, you know, we'll come over for eight or 10 days and, and, and try to cover as best we can. And, you know, it sucks because you, you, there's places that you don't get to go to. And and I know those people are disappointed, but um, you just gotta, you know, we've got to be home. (laughs) <laughs> and so uh you know it's just it's just not as easy to be gone as it well, was suppose, back in the day. I suppose in that kind of industry as, as much as you're away for a while and something that this pandemic's maybe maybe showed people is when you're home you actually probably get to spend more time with your family and your kids because yeah. you're there all day every day well that was the thing that that I used to say all the time back when I um when I traveled a lot the thing was is that Sure, I was traveling and we were doing a lot of shows every year, but when I was home, I was home. So I was at the bus and I was making their dinner and putting them to bed. Um, and, and what I would say to anybody who would ask me about it, I would say, you know, my dad sold cars when I was a kid. Uh, he went to work at nine o'clock and came home at nine o'clock at night. Like that was about when I went to bed. I never saw the guy. Like the day that he was off was Sunday and like, sometimes we did something together as a family, but really for the most part, he was exhausted. So literally I didn't see the dude for years. Um, and so, you know, uh, that, that is one fortunate thing about this business. And, you know, it's funny, we did a, um, do you know the band cheap trick? Don't think of um, big, big band from, from here called cheap trick. Um, and I did an interview recently with um, the guitar player, but also his two adult sons who are both also dads for my uh, Rockstar Dad show podcast. And um, it was cool to hear their perspective. They were like, yeah, he'd be gone for like six months, but you know, you'd think he'd come home and he'd want to sleep for a few days, but he was up before we were cooking breakfast, you know? And I was just like, you know, that's the way you got to do that's it. That's amazing. You know, you, Got to be there and be present. And uh, so I don't think any of my three kids would tell you that, you know, that I missed anything. I mean, I think that they would say that they probably missed me sometimes. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I made sure that and I do make sure that when I am home, I'm present. So but yeah, my eight year old, um, you know, I've been home since March. Like he sees me every day. I, I think he's going to be pretty bummed out, you know, the first time I yeah. leave for an extended period of time. Tell me this, Jared. I don't know how I'd explain it to people in Scotland who do not have a clue what Chuck E. Cheese is, but having an eight-year-old son and, and being the, the voice of a cartoon mouse, that yeah. how, how would you explain it? Is it probably the equivalent of a similar to McDonald's KFC type chain? No. Um, it'd be closer to like what you guys have. Like, let's say like in a in one of your like nicer bowling alleys, how you have like the games and stuff and like you can win tickets and redeem the tickets for prizes and stuff. That's pretty much what it is, but it's, it's for littler kids. Um, ski ball, you know what ski ball is? No. Okay. Ski ball, you know, you roll the ball and it goes into a hole and you get points for it. You try and get it in the middle almost. Yeah. 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 Okay. That kind of thing. And then games that give you tickets and those things. So, Basically, there's 550 of those in this country, Amazing. and they're big. It's a big pizza chain that has this other element of it. And um, used to back in the day, all of the restaurants had these huge animatronic um, characters that the curtains would open and the band would actually play songs. And no way. you know, he or animated. Um, and things like that. They've, they've toned that down a smidge, but it's like where you take your kid to have a birthday party. Yeah. Um, and that kind of thing. And, and, uh, you know, it's, um, so, you know, for me, it was super nostalgic because I loved Chuck E. Cheese when I was a kid, I went there all the time. My grandma took me every single time I visited her sometimes twice. And, um, you know, uh, to, to be able to get 
a gig like that, it's, uh, you know, it's, so, you know, it'd be like a, a smaller version of like Mickey Mouse. He's like a mascot of this chain of restaurants. Sure. And uh, I mean, for having an eight year old kid, that must be pretty cool. <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah, like- uh, yeah, because my my other two are more older. My my uh, my oldest two are um, about to be eighteen and fifteen, and I've been Chucky for about eight years. So you know, my my youngest son thought it was pretty cool, uh, or my oldest son thought it was pretty cool. But really, my youngest son has grown up his whole life with being me being Chucky e. Cheese, and he. Th- but you know, it's really cool. He, we still go from time to time he still does that. He goes up and dances with the mouse and, you know, you hear my voice over the speaker and stuff and he he's into it. Like it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't ruin it because it's me. Yeah. You know, I think that's really cool. I mean, I can imagine him being at school bragging to his, his mates saying, yeah, that's well, what. and the older two, the older two had Phineas and Ferb, you know, so you know, that, that was their whole life. Um, I was on Phineas and Ferb and doing that, that, that theme and playing a character on that show and stuff. So, um, they kind of all have had that, that thing to, you know, tell their friends, like, you know, my dad is this. And, and, you know, the, the teachers, I think like it more than the, than the kids, because the teachers are fans, you know, the, the teachers all know 1985 and um, you know, that kind of thing. So, uh, but you know, they're, they're awesome. But my, my daughter has really never done my, my middle son, um, Jack, who is about to be 15. he, he just flat out just tells you, like, he'll just go, my dad's famous. He's uh, this and this, you know, like, and just, that's it. My dad is famous and he just wear, is all out there. Uh, my youngest son, he's not, I don't know. I mean, he's not really like that, but he is, he'll, he'll tell somebody, yeah, my dad does that. It's not a big, my daughter, who's about to be 18, really just never told anybody. She was pretty adamant about, she didn't want people to just like her because her dad was famous. Okay. And, uh, but one day about a year ago, she, uh, she texts me during school and she goes, dad, what? Hey, all these kids in chemistry are talking about you. I go, Oh, okay. Is it good? Well, yeah. Do you know how many Spotify listeners you have a month? <laughs> I, I go, yeah, I think it's like 4 million, something like that. You know, she goes, dad, that's a lot. <laughs> I go, yeah. I've been trying to tell you. <laughs> that's amazing and, and without going off on a tangent I, I seen something today and it was a an artist from London I think it was and she put out a tweet about you know I have 400,000 Spotify monthly listens and I can't afford to pay my bills and yeah. it's like I suppose from back when you started music's totally changed hasn't it and it's I, I remember queuing up to buy your album outside Virgin Records in, in Glasgow and now it's like People just get it at the click of click of a button. Yeah, and often you know, those you know the the people who say those that things aren't putting it into perspective. I mean, no artist has ever made a living just selling music. I mean, I'm sure it exists, but it's just not a thing. It's you know we weren't making money off of CDs when there were CDs because there was a label involved and you yeah. don't ever recoup that. You're not ever getting paid from, from selling music. So, you know, it's a new world streaming. At least you're getting something, at least you're getting a check yeah. um, that the labels themselves, you know, aren't getting. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. You know, there's performance royalties out there on YouTube. So there's a thing called Sound Exchange that pays you for all of that shit. You know, but quite frankly, you know, this business is a hustle. You know, we I I've I said I've said for 26 years, you know, and not literally, but this is my what I say is you know, our band eats t-shirts. I mean, that's we make money selling merch, playing shows, you know. I mean, and it's not easy. I mean, you know, I think people think that we're super rich and famous. We're not. I mean, I, I guarantee you, if I was rich, I would not keep the schedule that I keep. I, I bust my ass because I need to to provide for my family and to fi- provide for my dudes. And you know, quite frankly, our hits happened in the the in that little pocket of Napster and LimeWire and all that shit when nobody was buying records. So the 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 90s bands were the last ones to make 
a shitload of money off selling a bunch of records, you mm-hmm. know, but that's not the 400,000 listener person. Yeah. You know, you're, I, I, you, you have to just, people need to put it in perspective. And I, and I, I do preach this. I, you know, I, if you think you're just going to start a band and you're going to make money from streaming and, and that's going to be your career, you are in the wrong business. Like this is a hustle. You need to find 12 different things that make you money uh, in order to make a good living. And uh, you know, quite it's not easy <laughs> it is not easy and i think you guys have been testament to that hard work as well haven't you it's like as you says you're, you're touring constantly be that in europe be that in, in the uk or even in the states you're constantly on the road and yep. as you say is it if, if you want to make money you need to put in the graft you gotta get it th- you gotta get it there you know like people again you, you math mathematically it just doesn't it doesn't make sense for you to go record an ep over here at john's house and put it out and think enough people are going to buy it Madness. so that you can and, and i see tons and tons of people on the internet they're like this spotify doesn't even pay me enough to recoup my ep well it's okay well you need to also be pushing it on itunes and maybe you need to make 200 physical copies and, and autograph them and sell those to people or maybe you need to go and play a free show and do a merch special or what you know whatever i i don't know your thing but i'm looking at your band on facebook and you have 500 likes you're not hustling like you're not working hard yeah and i i don't you know and and I hope that if somebody hears that, they don't, that doesn't come across as me being an asshole. I'm just, I really want people to be successful and I want, I want to help people, but you know, you have to be active on social media. You have to do more than just create good songs. It's, it's net. You've never been able to just make an album and be successful. Like that's not, it, there's so much other shit that comes along with it. there's charisma and there's just the ability to talk to people. And there's a lot of luck involved, you know? Um, but we live in a time now, though, where you can just put out all you want. You know, you can just keep putting out songs. How, how successful you want to be is up to you. Yeah. You, how much you want to bust your ass. And that, that might sound harsh, but that is the reality. You know, that is ultimately it is. the reality. Yeah. It is. Yeah, I, I, work, I work 16 hour days. Um, I do so much shit that my wife will just go, I had no idea you even did that. And I was like, <laughs> I did that eight months ago. Like, I, you know, I got to. I had a Christmas song. I just released a Christmas song today. Me and Kelly, uh, Jarrett and Kelly is my, as one of my other bands just released a Christmas song. And, you know, my manager was like, when the hell did you do this? And I, we did it last week. You know, like I, I'm you, I hustle, you know, and you know, that that's just it. It's, it does sound harsh, but honestly, it's just something to where people need to know. Like, again, you can't half ass medical school. You know, like if you're going to go to medical school, you got to fucking go and mean it, you know? Yep. And it's the same thing with being an artist. Like you, you have to, you have to pave your own way. Talking of hard work, how, how many shows was it you done during that initial lockdown? Because you were almost doing one every night, weren't you? Yeah, I did over a hundred. Um, but I did uh 50 something on my social distance uh, stage it tour. And then I did a bunch of charities basically i said yes to everything um to keep myself busy so i did a bunch of charity shows and um just basically appearances on emo night and um you know i did uh, uh you know songwriting things and but i did over 100 shows and then i took a break so that for bowling for soups live stream but i'm about to pick back up i'm gonna do um probably do one later this week and then I'm going to plan a family friendly Christmas show where I can do some Christmas songs. That's amazing. People can, people can watch with their kids and I, I won't swear too much. It's funny because you, you do have that mixed audience, don't you? Like you, you know, when you can use some sweary words and when you can be a bit rude and then you've also got the kids that will be more than happy. Yeah. You know? yeah. You know, I mean, we have to sort of, you know, you just have to know what you're going to get. Like, you, you know, it, I think that there was a time maybe around the time Phineas and Ferb got, super popular where people were bringing like little, little kids to our shows. And <laughs> quite true. frankly, we are not family friendly. Like if, if you see us in the United States at like a fair or something like that, we'll be, we'll be PG 13. We'll be, you know, we won't be that dirty, but if you're coming to see us at like our show, you know, in our world and you know, it's, it's going to be dirty. <laughs> and, uh, you know, quite frankly, that's just 
that's the kind of entertainers we are. That's the band we are. And, and most, uh, you know, 99% of the parents are like, yeah, we well, you know we listen to you anyway. You know, yeah. it's not something that they don't hear on TV. So just have at it. Have you ever seen, you must have seen this over the years, that there's now parents out there that came to watch you as kids that now bring their kids? <laughs> yeah, I'm, three generations. There's uh, there there's uh, grandparents now that had brought their kids, and now that kid has a kid, and you'll no have way. three generations in there. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's crazy. Must make you feel old. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's funny. I get that a bunch and I don't, I, you know, it's, I, I mean, I know 26 years seems like a long time. And I know that, you know, when I know that, you know, my, at least my num my age uh, is not young, but I don't, I don't feel old. Like I, to me, it's more of just like a testament to what we've accomplished. You know, yeah. when somebody's like, man, I'm going to make you feel old. You were my favorite band in the seventh grade. I'm just like, I think that's fucking dope that you're still coming to see me <laughs> yeah. after this many years, you know? And if somebody brings their kid and like, Hey, this is my dad. And he brought me to my first show. And this is my son. I'm that it, it makes me feel like, Holy shit. Like we're, this is fucking great. And we're something that these generations have in common, you know, that, and that's a big, big thing for Bowling for Soup um, early 2000s was parents bringing their kids to shows and saying the parents would come up to, I mean, this was every day and just go, I just want to thank you because until your band, I had nothing in common with my child. Like we agreed on nothing. We did nothing together. And now we go to Bowling for Soup shows together. And that's where we found our common ground. That's special, isn't it? That is special. Okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, we sing about beer and farts and, and girls and, and, uh, and the beat is fun and we're funny. And so, you know, what's not to, uh, what's not to lack as a family. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny. Cause I started this podcast saying, you know, it was, must've been 13 and my dad was waiting to make sure that I got in. And then I came to see you last year in, in the Academy in Glasgow and my mate Connor was doing tattoos in the West End bone for soup tattoos. You guys were there. Yeah. Uh, and then we were all out for a beer after it, you know, it's like, that is a journey in itself. And as you said, it's, it's really special that the same people are still coming, coming along and enjoying themselves. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like we, um, you know, our songs are part of people's lives. You know, I, I saw it online yesterday. There's a, I follow a girl from a TV show and I saw her having a conversation with so, another fan of hers where she was like, the girl was like, do you know that Jared, likes your show, you know, and she was like, yeah, he follows me. It's fucking crazy. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, it, it's, I forgot what, what we were talking about. Actually, I just lost. I my was name. just saying it's really special. You know, that people have had this journey from being kids all the way to adults. And yeah, yeah, and totally. Yeah. And that was just, that was that thing. It was just like, yeah, I used to listen to this in the car with my mom and you know, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely very special. What does the, the future hold? I know that you are coming over here next year. I don't know if you're doing Scotland. I know you're doing the seaside towns and it's funny. We are I'm not. So yeah, we're doing the South. Um, so it's complicated because of COVID. I mean, we had just done a big tour back in February. So we did major cities back then. So what we always do is we do a major city thing and then we come and we do some smaller markets and then we come back, you know, vice versa. And that's pretty common, I think. Um, but that tour was supposed to be happening right now yeah. and it's not. So we basically moved that to May. Uh, and, and you know, I've, it, it, it kind of worked out to where we're just along the sea. So I was just like, fuck it, let's call it, you know, surf the UK. Yeah. And we, I don't know that we've ever been over in May. If we have, it's been, I know we've been over in April, but you know, it'd be nice to be over there where it's not freezing cold and raining every day. You know, <laughs> you can wear um, those duckies and not feel bad about it. Exactly. Right. Um, and so, yeah, we're coming back over there for that, but there's plans already for what happens after that. Um, so it won't be long before we're back in Glasgow. Um, but yeah, uh, so lots of stuff happening for Bowling for Soup. Um, we have our second greatest hits songs. People actually like volume two that we're hoping to release, uh, just after the first of the year. Um, that should actually go on pre-sale pretty soon. Um, and then we do have a new record that's pretty much recorded. It just needs to be just kind of finished up and stuff that I'm hoping comes out in the spring. Um, and then in the meantime, we have some more cover songs happening. Lots of new music. Um, I don't know if people have seen on our Facebook, 
follow us on Facebook, but we have this thing that we're doing called Bowling for Soup shot out of a cannon. And it's essentially a Bowling for Soup television show yeah. that we're, it's going to just keep growing and growing and growing into where it, and eventually it will literally be like you turn it on and you're watching a show that we're on. Um, so it's sort of being adapted in real time, you know, in front of you, in front of you guys. So, and there's always little hidden fun shit in there. So check that out. And then, um, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, we'll, we'll actually be working on another live stream too before long. Uh, that'll probably happen before we head to the UK. So something, uh, next year and, um, you know, I'm, uh, Super stoked. I mean, I'm, I, I miss the dudes. And um, in fact, we're doing a, a, a hang tomorrow night and uh, I'm excited about that. It must be, it must be quite strange when you're together so often and now you are only seeing each other online and, and on Facebook and, and hanging out. But listen, it won't be long until you're back together. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's, uh, you know, I mean, Rob is newly married and he's got his brother up close. Um, Gary has his wife and kids you know, I've got my wife and kid and I've got my own uh, and kids and I've got my own little bubble here where people that um, we only see each other. So I at least have a social life. You know, Chris is pretty much just locked away because he lives a little ways away from us. So, um, you know, love the dog, do our, so, hey, he loves his dogs. He does love his dog. Yeah. And but we do our best to make sure that we're getting together as often as possible. What does uh, Christmas look like in your household? Well, everything's up. I got to, I got to finish. Um, we have some lights out on the tree. I got to fix those after this, actually. That's what I'm going to go work on. And, um, and what's, what is after that? Um, yeah, I mean, it'll be pretty low key because everybody's still social distancing here, but, uh, all of my kids uh, will be here for Christmas Eve. We celebrate Christmas on Christmas Eve. Two of them will go to their moms on, uh, Christmas Day, Christmas Day, for uh, for me and my wife and my youngest, we'll go over to her parents, and uh, we basically play wee bowling and get completely shit faced on mimosas. That sounds brilliant. That sounds brilliant. Happy birthday, Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> Jared, I hope you have a good one when it comes, and and thank you so much for your time. I've, I've really enjoyed that. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for hitting me up, man. This has been awesome. Uh, you know, and if you ever want to have one of the other guys on, let me know. And that, that uh, brilliant. Yeah. I had a blast. I'd, I, I, I'd love to uh, buy you a pint when I'm, uh, when I'm in Glasgow or I'll let you buy me one either I'm way. Gonna, I'm going to hold you to that actually. All right. Well, you know where to find me. <laughs> you know, I, I actually, believe it or not, my, my gran is from Cleethorpes. Uh, and I know you're doing that on the tour and I was thinking, oh, maybe, maybe come down, maybe come down. That's what I keep telling people. Everybody's like, you're not playing my town. I'm like, you have six months to plan your holiday. <laughs> exactly. They're giving hotels away right now. Like they're literally begging you to please fucking stay at our hotel. <laughs> you know? Like make a plan, get down there. Absolutely. No, that was brilliant. Really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who has uh, listened to this episode of the DW podcast. If you've not done so, please like and subscribe uh, and check out some of the previous episodes. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>